everybody. My name is Paula Sutton, and I'm at the Edigo Museum. And tonight we found a program. This is Dave Baker, 29th State. He is a history buff for all of Iowa, and he's coming to present to us tonight. Um, goes on around Edigo. So it was sponsored by our friends at Austin News. You can look off the back in the corner. Those are all your friends of mine as well. Um, they come to some of our programs here at the museum and they're like, we want to do something to help. What can we do? And so they sponsored. Dave to come and present to us tonight. And I want to thank all of our Ready Go Racers that came out tonight and have their beautiful cars out there to show everybody. And just enjoy the program and enjoy looking at the cars afterwards and enjoy. Well, thank you very much, Phyllis. And then thank you everybody for coming tonight. I'm gonna have some more thank yous here in just a little bit of time, but uh, really appreciate everybody coming out. How are we doing tonight? Great. Woo you know, I, it's always funny when I think of Eddyville because I'm from Ankeny and in Ankeny every year they have a big marching band competition. And I know this doesn't have anything to do with the ghost towns, but hear me out, because this, this is where I go with Eddyville every time I, I think about coming through here. So years ago, back before we had cell phones and smartphones, we had the judges for the marching band up in the upper booth. And they had students like myself running information from the judges on the ground up to the booth. And I was one of those people. And for whatever reason, the announcer we had that night, every time he would say Eddieville Blakesburg, he would say it, Eddieville Blakesburg. <laughs> I believe you guys won that night, which was fantastic, but I got so dang tired of hearing Eddieville. And so every time I drive through, that's all I can think of on there. So. You know, the thing of it is that I think if he had tagged Fremont onto the end of it, he probably wouldn't be able to do that quite as well. So, him. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, I, I am very excited to be here, and I'm very excited to talk history. And if you've ever been to one of my programs, you know that I get very animated, and I get very, very excited about the topic of Iowa and Iowa history. I know it seems a little bit weird. My wife thinks so, too. But I'm hoping to show you tonight why I get excited about it, and maybe explore some of the reasons um, why history is important, and what we can use it for today, and how ghost towns are relevant and important today. And so I'm gonna start off a little bit south of Eddyville this evening, down in Urbana Township. Now, there were lots and lots and lots of post offices all over the state of Iowa in the 19th and early 20th century. And just because there was a post office there did not necessarily mean that there was a town there, because they would put country post offices out there for the convenience of the farmers. And so you would typically have post offices that were at section crossroads or places where there'd be travelers coming through because it made it very, very easy for those people to stop in and pick up their mail. And down in Urbana Township, for a very brief period of time, there was a post office just outside of Blakesburg, can't say it quite that fast without the Eddiesville in front of it, called Humacana. Has anybody ever heard of this one? Woohoo! Okay. Didn't think so. Why haven't you heard of it? Well, because nothing of note ever happened there. Um, <laughs> Seriously, I dug through about seven different newspapers trying to find anything of interest there. And the only thing I came across was actually an entry from St. Joseph, Missouri. Huh? That's nowhere near Blakesburg, is it? And the St. Joseph Daily Herald on September 27, 1899, ran an article stating that the postmaster, whose name was Hiram Long, was dead at the age of 77, and that the post office was going to close. And it did. 1899, he died, and that was the end of it. Now, this is interesting to bring up because it was not mentioned in Eddyville, it was not mentioned in Blakesburg, it was not mentioned in Ottumwa, it was not mentioned in Oskaloosa, it was not mentioned in Pella. Those have been the biggest newspapers in the area. This place was so inconsequential that it didn't even make the local papers, although somehow it made a Missouri newspaper. So why is it even worth mentioning? Well, you have to remember that people use that as their residence, and one of the things that I do is I do genealogy. And that is one of the big reasons why I get excited about these places because there are lots and lots of town sites that maybe weren't even actually towns, but people claim them for their residents. And those places are very, very important for those of us who do historical research and genealogy. Now, we're gonna look at a lot of places that are more important than this in the grand scheme of things tonight, but I want you to keep that in the back of your mind sort of as a warm up, that just because there's nothing left of a place doesn't mean that it doesn't have a story. It may not be a very interesting story, but it's got a story nonetheless to it. And so if you, uh, real quick, a little bit about me here. If you are familiar with Facebook and you use Facebook, my page is the 29th state. It is 
updated regularly on Facebook, I do have a website which is not updated regularly. Why? Because I am officially the worst web programmer in the entire universe. If you don't believe me, go out there and check out the website. I hired a guy to do it a few years ago. He ended up having a baby and dropped out of the project. Then I had two, and well, here we go. So, um, iowa29state.com is very basic. If you want the good history, go to Facebook, the 29th state. If you're not on Facebook at this point, it's probably best to just keep off it because it's usually like a family feud out there. Um, I do do my best to keep my page positive. Occasionally, things do sneak through. If you saw the Hummiston debate last week, we tried to tamp that down a little bit. Wayne County got a little excited. Um, but sometimes it just does come out. People get very passionate about their communities, and people get very passionate about the way their communities used to be. And my goal is to get people excited about not only what used to be, but what it could be in the future, and have some vision around that. So just a little bit before I get started here, I do want to have a few thank yous in there. So of course, Ken and Ginger, thank you so much. I appreciate you both so much. Thank you for setting this up. Um, and, and Phyllis and the museum here, absolutely. This is fantastic, uh, just wonderful job. Um, I would be absolutely at fault if I did not thank Mr. John Jacobs for his excellent historical scholarship over the years and that fantastic Mahaska County history book that you contributed to, which has been an immense help for about, I don't know, two dozen programs that I've done now. So, uh, John, thank you for, for that. I really do appreciate it. I don't think Rochelle Chase is here tonight, but uh, if you're familiar with Rochelle's work, she has done all, not all, but a lot of the big writing on Buxton. And not only does she tell the story about Buxton, but she puts it in context. And that's what's really important because as we look at other ghost towns and other coal mining towns, there's a lot of similarities between Buxton and, and those other ones. And then of course, I don't think I've got anybody here from Parks Library, but uh, if anybody's here from Iowa State or Iowa State Parks Library, they are a godsend, um, especially their interlibrary loan program. Okay, so where did this all start? Just to give you a little bit of background about who I am and why I go out and hunt ghost towns. So anybody know this place? Go Dutch, right? Okay, I'm gonna take you back real quickly. 2009, I'm working at it as an intern in Pella, specifically at the Pella Historical Society. They paired me up with a guy named Ralph Yarsma. Ralph Yarsma's family makes good Dutch letters. I know that because I had to join the cross country team because I ate too many Dutch letters. Now, Pella's got a lot of windmills, right? This one isn't their biggest one, but it's one of the first ones you see when you get on the town square. If you look farther down, you can see the Vermeer windmill, which is much bigger and more impressive, and you can actually go up inside of it. And in 2009, I was interning at the Vermeer Windmill and Pella Historical Society. Great place to work. And they sent us one afternoon on an excursion over to a community called Elkhorn. I thought I had a picture up there, but I've omitted that. Elkhorn is a Danish museum, Danish community. Danish museum, has anybody been there before? It's a wonderful museum. If you get a chance to go over to Western Iowa, check it out. It is, it is a very, very nicely done museum. They've got a lot of neat pieces. Who knows who Victor Borg is? Yeah, a few people, okay, good, good. Victor Borg's piano is there, so just a fun fact for you. I have that here in Iowa. I told that to some middle schoolers one time, looking like, oh, Victor Borg, no, never mind. Anyway, so I was working in Pella, and I went to Elkhorn, and I thought, geez, this is just fantastic. There's these communities and these museums, and there's all these great places that people may not even know exist. They may not be familiar with them. And so I did what every logical person should do in a case like that. I decided I was going to visit them all. Easier said than done in the state of Iowa. Because what happened was I came back to Marion County, where I was at, Central, and as I was driving through Marion County, I passed a little town called Otley. And so I got my camera out and I thought, I'm gonna take a picture of Otley. And that's gonna be one of those towns that I drive through. And it turns out that Otley is not a actual town under Iowa law. It is unincorporated. And in Iowa, there are 900, well, there were 947 incorporated towns. Now there's 943, 42, probably by the end of this year when Leroy gets done. And so what I have done since then is I've not only gone to the incorporated towns, but I try to go out and hit all the unincorporated places, and as much as possible, I try to hit the small little ghost towns in between because I want to tell their stories because they've got some fascinating things to uncover and discover. Now, here's the thing about Pella or Oskaloosa or Eddieville or places like that. It's very, very easy to find pictures of what they looked like in the old days. A place like Homakana, or even to some extent Buxton. Buxton's a little bit better documented because it came along a little bit later. Photography is really, really hard to find from the mid 19th century. And this is the reason why. Now, I don't know much about the woman in this picture. Does anybody know what this actually is here? It's a tintype. Now, in the 1830s, 40s, and 50s, there were three primary modes of photography. You had the daguerreotype, 
which was the oldest form, very, very complicated to make. You had to have a very, very good knowledge, working knowledge of chemistry. Of course, chemistry was very basic at the time. Ambrotype was the next that came along. Ambrotypes were a little bit easier to do. By the time they got the tin type, they still had to have a good working knowledge of chemistry, but they were able to make like, these likenesses and these images in a much quicker amount of time, and they were able to make them in a more portable manner. And so what happens is you start seeing by the 1860s, 1870s, these start to show up on the frontier. Now, the downside is, is primarily they are of people. You don't get a whole lot of landscapes in there. So it does get, leave a little bit to the imagination of what some of these towns look like. And so as I'm doing research, I do a lot of work with newspapers. And you'll see that tonight as we talk about the different places. So unfortunately, I couldn't find any photographers in any of our ghost towns tonight. But you can see here, as early as 1857, professional photographers were advertising their, their trade in Ottumwa. And so you can see here they were advertising spherotypes and ambrotypes. And I love this here that the, uh, the, uh, the likenesses they're talking about, that they would, um, they, the likenesses that they capture on there. Because if you think about the photography at the time, when they actually had the negative in there, the plate in there, that was present with the person who was being photographed. So you really think of it capturing their essence in a way that film and especially digital media doesn't necessarily do. This is the one I was looking for here, actually. Amber types of photographs. So in good style and neatness. We'll take card pictures, full length, or vignettes, and have them well-mounted or plain and fancy cards as cheap as can be obtained at this place. All about cheap, right? So what they were able to do is they were eventually able to get to where they could print those on those paper cards. And as you got in the 1870s and 1880s, you started seeing more of the paper card and the cardboard prints on there. And that allowed photographs to be duplicated and mass-produced. And so that's when we start getting into the 1880s when there's a lot of postcards and things like that that actually give us a glimpse into what some of these communities looked like. John, you know a few things about the postcards, I think. So, what do we make of this? Okay, again, a lot of these places we don't have photographs of, so we have to kind of use our imagination. Now, there's a lot of sites that they've got signs out there, and so what I want you to do is just kind of take a thought back of what this site might have looked like. So, Pin Oak, Brompton School. Brompton was a very, very small uh, postal, postal town. It had a post office and some houses that clustered around it, and eventually they had a school. But it was a very remote area at the time. And so what I want you to do is think about what that might have looked like, what the school might have looked like. Can anybody think of what the school might have looked like in a rural setting like that? Sure. How, would it, how big would it have been? Uh, one room, about the size of this room. Yep. What would you have had in the front of it? You would have the teacher's desk, the chalkboard, and a easel. Yep. More than like. I went to one of them. You went to one of them. Did you go to one of them down here? Ash Grove. On the other side of Lakesburg. Yep. I was going to say, Ash Grove, that's, uh, if I remember correctly, a little triangular plot. It's about all that's left there of it. And the cemetery, I think, is still there. Yep. It's got a turnstile going into the cemetery. I've never seen one of those before. My grandpa was there. My great-grandpa. Your great-grandpa was there. And I can't remember his name, but the founder of Ash Grove had a really strange name. I want to say it was like Peru Blackerly or something weird like that. They had some strange names back there. <laughs> But the point is, is that these post offices were only around, oftentimes, for a very short period of time. Brompton Post Office was only around for two years, and it was rolled into Blakesburg. And we see that a lot, because what would happen was people would get the postal boxes, they'd move them into their house, somebody else would become the postmaster, and it might move a mile down the road, or might move three miles down the road. And so you'd be left with maybe a school and, and perhaps a church and some scattered houses, and the post office would kind of jump around. There's even examples, not so much down here, but in northern Iowa, where post offices jumped the county line. Um, Batch Grove, sometimes in Wright County, sometimes in Hamilton County. And so the post office has become very, very interesting because they don't always tell us exactly where people live. They give us a relative idea, but it usually could have been anywhere within a one, two mile range. Again, if you're doing genealogy, that's helpful information to know. First post office in Monroe County was called Clarksville. It was opened in 1846 by W.G. Clark. Did not have a town associated with it. If you know anything about Clarksville, Iowa today, it's up in Butler County. They did that a lot, too, where you see names switched around. There were lots of Washingtons, lots of Franklins, lots of Fairviews. We'll talk about a Fairview here in a little while. One name that did only pop up one time in the Iowa records over in Monroe County was the name of Selection. And Selection was a post office that existed for a, a, a period of time, 1881 to 1903. And it also had a church that went along with it. Now, the community was never platted, so it was never laid out into a formal town. It was just a place where people congregated. And so over time, there would be people that would build their houses in close proximity. Some of them would have been farmers. Some of them would have been bigger farmers. Some of them smaller farmers. 
but they all coalesced into this area and they used selection as their post office. Now, it eventually had a station on the Centerville, Moravia, and Albia Railroad. The Centerville, Albia, and Moravia was a small regional railroad that was only around for a few years. But that gave selection a little bit of a presence when it came to maps. And so you'd actually see it on some of the early timetables of Monroe County and some of those old railroad maps. Um, the businesses include it, that eventually coalesced around there included a cheese manufacturing facility, a general store, two carpenters, a grain dealer, as well as the United Brethren Church. So if you can imagine, does anybody know where Selection's at? Yeah, I figured John would. Um, <laughs> selection, the, the cemetery is all that remains there today, but if you imagine there being a place that actually produced cheese out there in the middle of nowhere, it's kind of a funny thought. Of course, back then it wasn't exactly in the middle of nowhere. Now, of course, when we think of ghost towns, this is probably the most famous one in Iowa that comes to mind. Who's heard of Buxton? Great, we're not talking about Buxton tonight. If you want to talk about Buxton, have Rochelle Chase come down here. Um, she knows more about it than I do, although her books are fantastic. Buxton is very interesting, though, because in addition to being a coal mining town and being integrated, it was significantly larger than most of the other coal camps. Now, it was not, not all of them were small. Um, Buxton was not necessarily a complete outlier, but it is unusual in its size, and it occupied almost an entire square mile. Of course, there's very little of it left today. Now, a lot of ghost towns in Iowa look more like this. So Buxton is what you think of kind of that typical, I don't want to say Wild West, but if you think of the Wild West ghost towns, you have the buildings that are partially collapsed. A lot of times they're wooden buildings. We don't have those in Iowa. Why? Because we have blizzards and derechos and tornadoes and things like that, and wood buildings just don't stand up if they're left abandoned. And so the brick ones sometimes fare a little bit better, but a lot of times with these small communities, they end up looking like this once the population moves on. And so this is Bidwell. This is over in Wapolo County. Um, post office existed from 1888 to 1913. Then it, was, then it was discontinued for a short period of time, and it picked up again in 1915. Now, it makes it challenging for somebody like me to drive out to a place like this to take a picture because I'm driving out in the middle of nowhere to take a picture of... Well, what exactly did I take a picture of there? Some old railroad tracks and a couple trees. And that's actually better than some places I showed up at the photograph, which, again, my wife scratches her head and goes, why do you do this? Well, sometimes it is frustrating to drive out in the middle of nowhere and discover that there is nothing there. But I do try to carefully research each town site before I go out there and try to get kind of familiar with it so I can tell the story. And here's what Bidwell would have looked like in 1908. So this is taken from the Standard Atlas of Wapolo County. It was a George Ogle production. George Ogle was an atlas maker from Chicago that made a lot of fantastic maps um, at the end of the 19th century. You can see here the Chicago, Milwaukee, St. Paul Railroad borders on the north. On the south side there you have about 17 lots. That was all the town was. Had a station, had a post office, and had a few residents that lived in the area. It was never much to write home about. But people lived there. Compare that against Tyrone, which was a residential community and was a well-populated community at one point in time. 1867 to 1881, again, 1882, 1909, had a little lapse in there where the post office was discontinued. You can see up here, we've got a plat, there's a livery, there's a hotel, there's a general store, and there's a blacksmith, among other things up there. So this was a much more established town than Bidwell, but if you look here, not much left of it today. Um, they also had a lawyer there, which is also probably worth mentioning. Their population of 50 in 1905, according to Polk's Gazetteer and Business Directory. So 50 people, um, 1905, lived in the town of Tyrone, approximately. It was never incorporated, so we don't have an actual count of how many people truly lived there. Now, as I talk about maps, you have to remember we have to kind of keep those with a grain of salt, because while George Ogle did a fantastic job with maps, Back in the early mid part, I don't want to say early, but the mid part of the 19th century, map making was very, very primitive in Iowa. And so when you're doing genealogical research and you're doing ghost town research, it can be very deceptive sometimes when you're looking at the map. This one here is a great example. So this, is the, this map is actually called Showing Routes of the Proposed Railroads. It's a University of Iowa map, or owned by the University of Iowa, rather. And if you take a look here, you'll notice that there's a number of issues with this map. Most notably here, this is Pella Colony of the Germans. Don't tell the Dutch that. <laughs> and so the problem is a lot of these map makers spent very little time in Iowa. Some of them didn't spend any time out here at all. And so you really get kind of some skewed information on these. Now, as you get close to the Civil War, the maps do get better. 
So Iowa in the 1850s, what did it look like? Well, there wasn't much to look at, honestly. Eddyville, of course, was, a, was one of the early communities, and uh, it was established as a trading post. Originally, this area was known um, as a settlement for the Sac and Fox tribe. Chief Hardfish was one of their leaders, and there's a monument for him out, kind of disoriented about that way, I think. Now, Eddyville um, was a very successful trading post. I don't need to tell you that. There was a lot of ferry activity. One of the early bridges across Des Moines River was located here. But I bring all this up to illustrate the fact that it's just a quirk of fate that Eddyville is here and some of the other ones are not. Because there were a lot of early trading posts and there were a lot of early communities located along the river. And what usually happened to river communities in the 1850s is that they flooded. And guess what happens to log cabins when they flood? Down the stream they go, which is what happened up at Dudley and what happened up at Red Rock and what happened up at uh, Ford, which is on the Warren County side of, of Carlisle. And so a lot of these early communities did not survive. So Eddyville got lucky in that regard that it, it managed to last as long as it did. And so you can see here on this map of 1854, there's a lot of communities that are establishing themselves along the Des Moines River. So there's Ottumwa, we've got Eddyville right here. Um, further up, we've got Bell Fountain is in Mahaska County. That's kind of a famous ghost town. It's not completely abandoned, but smaller than it once was. And then on up into uh, Marion County, Pleasantville, uh, Red Rock, and Bennington, as you get closer to Polk County. So you got all these towns that are along the Des Moines River, all of them are prone to flooding. Now, in addition to the rivers, if you think about how settlers moved across to the west, traveling up a river was very easy for the most part because they could float barges up the river, they could, they could get up the river by the water fairly easily, and it gave them a water source. What was the other way that people came out west? Well, not train quite yet, but wagon, exactly. Covered wagon or, or oxen wagon, depending on how rich or poor they might have been. And so there were, there were a lot of communities that were established along wagon routes. And one of the earliest ones that we know about was down here in um, Urbana Township, and it was actually called Urbana City. Now again, if you think of Urbana today in Iowa, you think of probably um, Benton County, which is where the town of Urbana is. This map shows it down here, kind of south um, of Avery. It was probably actually a little bit further north than what this map puts it on there. We don't know exactly where it was because the wagon route changed a few times. And this is what Frank Hickenlooper said in the 1898 essay, or essay book that he wrote, rather, on Monroe County. So in 1858, a Mr. Evans laid out the town of Osprey. It had one house as a starter, and it soon died. Well, so much for Osprey. Smithfield and Hollidaysburg were also candidates for municipal greatness, but soon shared a like fate. Urbana City was started about the same time. It was once a flourishing village in the seat of the Soap Creek Civilization. Hot stuff, right? Soap Creek Civilization. It contained a flouring mill. That was a big deal for sure. A shingle splitter and an even bigger deal, a saloon. Today it, was a, today it is a cornfield. Okay, 1896, he's already writing this as it being a cornfield. So this town, even before the 20th century, was already pretty much gone, which is why we really don't know exactly where it was um, because there's really no evidence of it. And there were a lot of places like this that began in the 1840s and just lasted a short period of time. Who knows where Pleasant Corners is? All right, there we go. Now we're getting to home territory. Okay, not on a river and actually was not on the stagecoach route, but what happened was is Pleasant Corners was laid out when they put the survey lines in. So the sur surveyors for the counties came out and they laid out the townships. Some of them were laid out sooner than others. Monroe County was actually laid out pretty early on. And so the sections were a lot of the way the roads followed. And if you think about it, that's still the way a lot of the roads follow, right? And so Pleasant Corners was literally a pleasant corner of those crossroads. And that's where the town sprang up. Um, it was a Presbyterian community. It was a heavily Presbyterian community. And they all came to the hilltop. They congregated around. And that was where they built their houses. So they settled together as neighbors as part of this religious community. Now, eventually, the Methodists had their own church there. And they even had their own troop during the Civil War called the Pleasant Corners Company, which I think is just kind of a funny name for a war troop. Pleasant Corners, the war doesn't seem too pleasant to me, especially the Civil War. But William Glass, who was one of the residents there, one of the early residents, served as the founder of that company. Now, the problem with Pleasant Corners, it probably would still be there today, at least in some form, maybe more than the cemetery. Well, I mean, it, there is a little bit of a form there, but um, you know, this is what they would have seen when they first looked out from there. But the problem with Pleasant Corners is that the railroad bypassed it to the south. And instead of Pleasant Corners getting the station, a small community called Frederick got the station instead. And so by 1872, Pleasant Corners was already on its way out. We'll talk more about Frederick here in a little while. 
Now, this one might be one of the more perplexing things I've come across in my travels. Des Moines City in Mahaska County. Because last time I checked, Des Moines City is not in Mahaska County. But you have to remember that before the town of Des Moines existed, before Fort Des Moines existed, the Des Moines River was named, which is why Des Moines County is nowhere near the town of Des Moines, because Des Moines County was named for the river, and where does the river empty into the Missouri, or excuse me, the Mississippi River? Des Moines County. As a matter of fact, the town of Montrose, which is down by Burlington, Fort Madison, that area, that was the original site of Fort Des Moines. So Fort Des Moines number one was cleared down by Montrose. They moved it further upstream to its present location and they established Fort Des Moines there. But Des Moines as a city name was not in use yet. And so in 1851, there was a platted community in East Des Moines Township, Mahaska County called Des Moines City. And you can see here, this is taken from the Kioma Genealogical Society's book um, from 1984. It's a fantastic book if you haven't had a chance to look at it. Um, I know a lot of libraries have not it's well worth your time. You can see here that this was a very, very well laid out city. And I just look at the handwriting on this map. I mean, beautiful penmanship, all drawn out by hand on there. And if, one of the things I like best here is right here, you've got Market Street. You notice the way the properties are there? They planned it so they had a downtown area where they could have people park down there. They had parking, 1851. Now, again, the problem with Des Moines City was it was located along the river. We've already discussed that. Rivers are mercurial things. They tend to rise and fall and not always win and where we want them to. And so Des Moines City was not one that was able to have any sort of uh, longevity to it. It was platted by Isaac Severs and William Clement. They were the surveyors. Jim Nolster was the original landowner. Nolster was a transplant from Virginia. There's early evidence to indicate that he was an abolitionist. I don't have any of his writings, so I can't confirm that, but there were a lot of Virginia residents that did move to Iowa pre-Civil War. Now, one thing that Nosler did have going for him, or Nosler, was that he was a trained druggist and pharmacist. And if you can think about a pharmacist being out on the frontier, that was a very, very, very hot commodity. And so it made sense for him to be located near the river because it was easy for him to get things that came up the river, and it was easy for him to travel downstream as well. And so he was very important in those early years in that settlement. However, if you know anything about medicine in the 1850s, we probably wouldn't want any of this stuff today. Now, Des Moines City flooded for the first time in 1851. It flooded again in 1853, and after that, it pretty much um, disappeared from civilization. Now, as many times as floodwaters came up to Eddyville, there were also floods near Bridgeport. Of course, Bridgeport is located on the other side of the river from Eddyville. 1868, 1881 was the post office. There's not much left of it except for the cemetery. Although, is there? And I asked that question because when I was doing my research on Monroe County uh, several years ago, I discovered something about Bridgeport. This is what it looks like from Google Maps. Not particularly interesting like this, but if you go to the assessor's website from Monroe County, something interesting happens. You see this here? According to the assessor, the roads are still surveyed and laid out out there. Private property now, but they've never fully vacated the, the roads out there. So Bridgeport technically, in terms of a survey, still exists. Now, Bridgeport failed to grow much beyond this on here. Again, it was in an area that flooded, and so there's not a whole lot that, that ever transpired there. But another town, we've already hinted at a little bit, is in a very similar vein. So Frederick today has a few more houses perhaps in Bridgeport. Doesn't really look a whole lot from the air, but again, if you go to the assessor's website, that changes. And you can see the entire plat, essentially how it looked in the 1800s on there. Now Frederick was a railroad town. It was laid out for a Michigan congressman named J. Frederick Joy. What's interesting is he did not spell his name like that. He had a K on the end of it like we would expect it to. Uh, but Joy was, he was a very prominent, he was a prominent member of Congress. He was an executive with the railroad and he was very, very well liked in Iowa. And one of the things that he did was he actively encouraged settlement by immigrants. Most of his work was confined up into Wisconsin and Michigan. He didn't do a whole lot of immigration work here in Iowa. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. But one of the things that came into the Frederick area, um, again, along the Burlington, Missouri Railroad, which is what ran through there originally, was Swedish immigrants. And Frederick is an early example of a Swedish immigrant community. And so a lot of the people that lived there in the 19th century would have been Swedes. 
Now, if you know anything about Wapolo County, you know that that's not the only Swedish community in the area because there's another one not too far away. Does anybody know what it is? I'm seeing some people shaking. You got it, Munnerville. Munnerville was a very, very large, um, for its time, Swedish community, and it was one of the most well-known. Now, Munnerville is interesting because it was never platted. It, it never had any sort of formal layout to it. It was, again, just a neighborhood of like people that congregated in the area. And you have to remember, in the 1870s, they did not have things like pocket translators. They did not have things like English second language classes. And so a lot of these immigrants tended to pool together. Um, if you think about, well, of course, even Pella is a great example. Pella had the, the, week, the, um, the Dutch Weekblad newspaper until almost, I think, 1910 or something like that. And so you would have these immigrants that spoke their native languages, and that was very, very common in these small towns. Munderville is an example of that. Now, a few years ago, they got together and they put up this wonderful monument out there. And I, did anybody have anything to do with that? Dorothy did talk about this. Okay. Very good. So... Uh, I was just going to say, whoever did that, they did a beautiful job. It's a very, very nice monument out there. But it says on it, in the mid-19th century, many Swedish immigrants began arriving in the new frontier lands of Iowa. Confronted by many obstacles and hardships in their homeland, they made the difficult journey to begin a new life in America. Many were from rural areas, and this brought them open prairies of the Midwest. Swedish immigrants began arriving in this community they called Bergholm in 1847. The post office was established in 1870. The community became known as Munterville in recognition of the Swedish immigrant and prominent community leader with a wonderful name of Magnus Munter. Um, and that is what is inscribed there on that plaque in front of it. And it's really neat because you go out essentially into a place that feels very, very isolated and you stand there and you go, this community was the center of these people's lives. This was their livelihood. This was their home. This was where they went to school. This is where they worshiped. And it's a very, very powerful feeling when you stand out there and you hear the birds or the insects and that's all you may hear out there because it's such a contrast to what it would have been like 150 years ago. Now, Munderville, unfortunately, was never platted. The cemetery and the church are what remain out there today, but had things happened a little bit differently, it might still be on maps today, because there was actually another community up in central Iowa that was sort of a sister community, if you will, to Munderville. And it started in the exact same way. Some Swedish settlers moved up into Boone County, and they started a small settlement that instead of being named Bergstrom, was named Boxholm. Anybody heard of Boxholm? Yeah. Yeah, it's still there, and it's actually doing quite well. And they've got a great sense of humor up there, too, if you can't tell. But Boxholm and Munterville shared some of the common ancestry, and there's a lot of connections between those two communities, not just in language, but also in just the general culture. And so it's really interesting because, again, like Des Moines City and, and Bridgeport compared to Eddyville, Munterville compared to Boxholm, it takes just a very, very small twist of fate, and it completely changes which communities are on the map and which communities stay and which don't. Now, churches were very commonly a center point for these small communities. And so uh, Munterville, again, was an ethnic community, but not all of them were ethnic communities. Sometimes they just were tied together because of their religious preference. And Christiansburg was one of these places over in Wapolo County. You know, had a post office from 1851 to 1871. Now, the communities managed to, make some sem managed to maintain some semblance even 150 years later. The church is still out there, and there's still a town hall. But everything in this community was centered around the Methodist Episcopal Church. Um, and when you read the newspapers, that's evident. So, for example, the school at Christiansburg gave a delightful Saturday social, excuse me, delightful social Saturday night. Ice cream and strawberries were served. $14 was netted for the school library. <laughs> May 6, 1901. The Polk Township Board held an interesting meeting at Christiansburg on Monday. The attendance was quite large considering the bad roads. The proposition to vote for a $600 special tax to be used for the purposes of erecting a new school building at Christiansburg was defeated. It was defeated by five votes. The Atelma Courier, March 12, 1903. Some things never change. But even though they didn't have the big township school like they wanted to, they were looking at building a consolidated school building there, they still had the schoolhouse and again the town hall there, which were very important pieces for this community in addition to the church itself. And again, you can still see remnants of that when you go out there and, and walk around in that vicinity. 
Okay, we talked a little bit about the Swedish immigrants. Immigration was the hot topic in Iowa in the 1870s, and not in the same way it's the hot topic in Iowa today, but I'm not going to get into that because I'm a history person. Down in, or up, I guess further from here, up in Pella, there was a fellow by the name of Reinsberger. And Reinsberger was appointed by the Iowa governor at the time to work on immigration and try to encourage immigration into Iowa. Of course, Reinsberger being in a Dutch community, he had a little bit of an in with the Dutch, and of course he brought a lot of those in in the 1870s, and that not only ex expanded the towns of Pella, but that also expanded Orange City, Sioux Center, Hospers, and those other communities up in northwestern Iowa. Now, unlike the uh, Dutch, Reinsberger was actually a German, um, so maybe that map wasn't all that wrong about the colony of Germans. But he also had an in with a lot of the German settlers, and so he was responsible for bringing a lot of people over that eventually would work in the mines, not only in Marion County, but Mahaska, Monroe, Wapolo, and Jasper counties as well. And if you go into Pella, this is across the street from the Clockenspiels. Anybody know where the Clockenspiel is? You can actually still see his name on the building that was his store, which is pretty neat to see. So in addition to his efforts and the governor's efforts to bring people into the state in the 1870s, they also attracted a lot of people from the east, from the east coast in to not only live in Iowa, but also begin to consider visiting Iowa. So in the 1870s, 1880s, you start seeing a little bit of interest in tourism, which we think is probably kind of funny. You have to remember the 1870s, anything went for tourism because they didn't even have a Mount Rushmore at that time. So along with that, we have a lot of improved maps. A lot of the maps before the Civil War, as I said, they were not particularly accurate. Um, you may know the story of the Civil War. Ulysses Grant, when he was marching down south, he would actually stop in the general stores and buy maps because the War Department maps were that bad. They were better up north, but not much better. 1875, A.T. Andreas was a map maker from Chicago. He made beautiful maps, and he made an entire atlas of the state of Iowa. If you go into a lot of the local libraries, they'll have a copy of it about this big. It's a nice, nice book. It's a nice reproduction. It was put out in the 1970s. If you're lucky enough to get your hands on one of the original ones, which is pretty few and far between anymore, uh, it's a real treat because they've got these great big, beautifully done color maps. Um, if you ever have the chance to buy one, probably should do it because they're getting rarer, but the last time I saw one up for sale was about $3,000 out of my budget. But you can see here from these maps that they really are quite a bit more detailed than a lot of those early railroad maps. So you've got the railroads on here as well, you've got a nice survey of the river, but if you could look up closer, you'd actually see there's individual landowners listed on here, which again, very, very helpful for genealogical purposes. It also shows a lot more of those small rural post offices. So if we take a look here, this is Wapolo County. Um, you've got Blakesburg right here. Um, you've got Stock Station up there, which was another very small community. You've got Chillicothe up there. You've got um, Ottumwa, of course, but a little bit north of that is Dallanega, which of course has a uh, schoolhouse that's been restored. And so this map is very easy to use for us today because a lot of the survey lines are still the same. There's been a few changes. Township names have changed over the years. But really, for the most part, these are pretty accurate today. You see there's Albia right there, there's Avery. If you could see on here, which it's a little bit blurry just with the size of it, you can actually see the cemetery where the pyramids are. Um, Hickory Grove is on there. Uh, and once you get up here in the northern area, you start even seeing some of the actual coal mines being mapped on there. And there's a little indicator, it's a circle with a cross in the middle of it, and that's indicative, indicative excuse me, of a coal mine. Here's Mahaska counties. You see here we've got Oskaloosa, of course, in the middle of the county seat. Over here we've got um, Gibbon. Uh, we'll go down a little bit further. We've got uh, uh, Lacanta, which is Truax. Over here um, you've got Fremont. And so these are really, really useful for anybody that's interested in looking at um, what people would have, have really used in the 1870s. Again, Avery was one of the towns that we saw on there. Avery was a town on the Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy Railroad. Now, Avery is not a ghost town by any regards as far as I'm concerned but it is not a huge community by most standards. Now right here, this is a Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy lantern. And this would have been used in train stations all over southern Iowa. This one did not come from Avery, but they would have known what it looked like. And so in addition to general commerce, one of the things with the 1870s you start to see is business commerce. And where railroad stations and grain exchanges and things like that typically used whatever they could get their hands on, by the time you get to the 1870s, you start getting the railroads supplying things like this from the East Coast and from um, points further east. And if you can see here, I don't know if you can on here, it's actually stamped with the railroad name on there. 
and it's stamped under the West Lake Company out of Chicago, which is where the lanterns were made. So we get a demand, and with that demand comes an increase in commerce. And with an increase in commerce comes more places where there's going to be trading. So the Cherokee coal vein um, outside of Avery was an important place because it was a local um, hotspot for coal. Coal, 1866, was not widely mined in Iowa yet. As a matter of fact, coal hadn't even been around, it had been around, of course, but it hadn't been widely used um, during the Civil War in Iowa. There wasn't a whole lot of use for it, unless you were a blacksmith. But by the time Avery was platted, the railroad started to come through, there was an interest in coal mining. And another community that existed before the Civil War, but also kind of got on that same coal mining kick, was the town of Cuba. Cuba was a bit deceptive of a name because that was actually what the post office was. It existed um, for a little under 30 years there. There's a few remnants of it out there still. But Fairview was its actual name as a town. Now, why did they call the, the, the post office Cuba and the town Fairview? What was up with that? Well, they plotted the town as Fairview they went to go apply for the post office and they discovered there was already a Fairview in existence in Iowa, up in Lynn County. So they were not allowed to use the name Fairview because that would mean there were two Fairview Iowa post offices and that would be confusing. So they thought it was less confusing to use the name Cuba for the post office and use Fairview for the town because that's not confusing. Um, Cuba was not the only town to fall into this trap because Fairview also, was, also existed as a town in Story County. Today we call it Story City. Yes, the uh, Norwegian community with the carousel was also a Fairview. Now you can see here it was a small community. It was platted out, so it was a formally established town. I like that we've got Rough and Ready Road here. That's a great name, um, a tribute to, to General Taylor, no doubt. Uh, but again, if you go out to the survey, it's still there. The church uh, that I showed a few minutes ago is clear down over here, um, about a half mile to the west. But you can see the actual town site is right there and the cemetery is over on this, on this site over here. Now, Hines City, also known as Smoky Hollow, was another community that existed in the area of Cuba. Now, there's, there's nothing really of note of Hines City left, so this is actually Church of the Brethren that's probably geographically closer to Cuba and Fair, Fairview than it was to Hines City. But I figured you didn't want to see another picture of an open road, so I thought I'd give you something a little bit more interesting. Um, but the people who lived in Hines City would have been familiar with this area, and they would have known, they would have at least known of this church. They would have seen it in passing, if not actually attended there. Hines City, or Hines as it's occasionally known, existed from 1899 to 1916. And Smoky Hollow, again, was the name of the mine that was there. And the Smoky Hollow Mine was one of many, many mining um, sites in the, the Tri-County region there. So what they did was, cool, Coal was discovered in Iowa um, way back before the Civil War. It was discovered up by Beacon. And Beacon was really one of, the big, one of the big early coal mining centers. And so what happened is, is Beacon is really where things started out and then it spread up and down the river. So you started to see coal mining into Marion and, and Polk counties and then eventually up into Boone. And it worked its way south the other direction as well. And so you can see Hines right down here there's Avery, there's Fairview, aka Cuba, Cuba Cemetery is right over here. And you can see all these little black dots here. Those would have all been houses and, and buildings that were in the community there. And I like how this map says C enlarged plat. We can bring it up and make it a little bit bigger. And you can see that there is some semblance of a community there. There's a Smoky Hollow Coal Company up there. The railroad built a spur into town there. The railroad built spurs into these towns so that they could get the coal easier. Not only could they ship them and make money off the coal, coal shipments, it was a great money maker for the railroad, but they could also use the coal. Now, of course, the thing about Iowa coal is that it did burn more sulfuric than a lot of eastern coals, and so that made it a little bit less valuable. But still, for the sake of convenience, it was there, it was, it was convenient, it was easy to use, so the railroads took advantage of that, especially the Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy, and most notably the Chicago and Northwestern. We'll get back to them in a little while. Oh, before I get onto that there. Um, One of the reasons that Heinz disappeared, and it disappeared very, very quickly, was that it was entirely reliant on the mining system. And one of the things that Rochelle Chase talks about when she talks about Buxton 
is just how the mines controlled every aspect of the community living. So if you think about Buxton, Buxton itself was a dry community. Now, Cooperstown across the road was absolutely not a dry community, and they did that intentionally because that was not owned by the mines. But the mining companies tried to keep a tight rein on things because they wanted to control that aspect. It was good for their business. If your miners go on strike and you threaten to pull their houses and their, their, their money and their ability to buy goods and able to support their family, all of a sudden the whole industry uh, really kind of grinds to the halt. Not only does the mine not work, but the people can't function either. And so it behooved these mining companies to own basically every portion of that, that um, entire industry so that they could really have a tight hold on their employees. And in some cases that worked out for the employee's benefit, in some cases it didn't. But what happens is when the mines played out, the miners had to go somewhere. And so a lot of these mining communities shut up in very, very short order. Like Buxton, they would move the houses elsewhere. Some of the buildings from Buxton ended up at, at um, Bucknell, some of them ended up at Haydock. Others of them ended up at Nelson Pioneer Museum. Um, most of them ended up getting torn down. But these mining towns, just because of that nature of it, they were somewhat um, impermanent. And so in a short period of time, Heinz disappeared off the map. Now what's interesting, I didn't bother putting the survey up here from, from the county, because it really wasn't all that interesting. None of this shows up on the current survey, except for two things. And I knew I was looking in the right place because there's a little parallelogram right here and a little rectangle right here, those are still there. Two little tiny subdivisions. Everything else has been completely vacated. Can hardly even tell where the railroad went. Now, Heitman's a little bit further from Eddyville. It's a little bit further from being a ghost town than Hines, perhaps. There's still people there. I would argue that sign. I do not honestly believe there are 101 people that live there. I think that was probably an old sign. Uh, that's still up there, but I don't think there's probably 101 people there. Maybe I'm wrong. There's certainly more than 101 people at the cemetery. I'll give them credit for that. <laughs> Not quite a ghost town yet, but certainly a contender for more, most likely to become a ghost town in the near future, probably. We talked about Buxton's direct predecessor being much a Kennock, right? Everybody thinks about, you know, the, the I'm drawing a blank on their names now, the brothers. McNeil, thank you. Um, you know, McNeil brothers, they were at Much Kinnick, they came down to Buxton. But in a lot of ways, Heitman had a lot of similarities with Buxton too. It existed, be, it existed about the same time. And in some ways, they were kind of modeled off of each other. And there's a few different examples of that. So Heitman was, was a platted mining town. Again, it was not an actual mining camp. It was a platted town, so they had roads. They had streets. They had a layout to it. And it was platted to accommodate approximately 1,000 residents. At its peak, it had about 500 more than that. Heitman topped out about 1,500 <coughs> residents. It was a little bit smaller than Buxton. It was about a third the size of Buxton. If Buxton's one square mile, this is about a third of a mile square. And it not only contained whites and African Americans like Buxton, but it also boasted a large number of other immigrants as well. Um, there were English, Swedish, German, Scotch, and the most significant of all was that this community was heavily Welsh. And that's important to me, not because my family ended up there, they ended up in Mahaska County, but my family was also Welsh and English when they came over in the 1880s um, and settled in the United States. And so a lot of these communities attracted these immigrants because not only did they speak a common language and have similar interests, but they were replicas of what they did overseas. There was a lot of coal mining in Wales in the 1880s, there was a lot of coal mining in this area in the 1880s, so it really worked well and it made sense for these immigrants to move into these places because they had some knowledge and understanding of what was going on. They had a trade that they could do. You can see here, 1919, this is from the, from the Ogle Standard Atlas, Wapalo County. Heitman was considerably larger than it is today. Um, let's see here, you've got the school up here. At one point in time, it had eight churches. Eight churches in Heitman. I don't know that they've even got one there now. Um, you can see there's the original town plot here in the middle. This was the downtown area. There's a hotel, there's a bank, a couple of general stores, there's a library, livery, excuse me. Um, and down the south side was where he had a lot of the African American miners. They lived on the south side of town, and the Welsh and the other immigrants lived on the north town. So it wasn't quite as integrated as maybe we think of some of the other ones, but it does seem to be a place where people relatively got along. There doesn't seem to be a whole lot of skirmishes in the newspaper. There are some. Um, but generally speaking, Heitman seems to be a, have been a pretty, uh, as far as mining communities go, fairly mellow. It certainly was no Angus or Zook Spur, if you know anything about Boone County. They were wild up there. 
Of course, today Heitman looks considerably different. There's not a whole lot going on in the actual town itself. This is now the downtown area. You can see it's mostly vacant. There's some trees there. The cemetery is going to be off to the west. Still kind of see the general layout of what the town would have looked like, though. Of course, like I said, most of the people who uh, would have known Heitman in its glory days are now at the cemetery. The town had a baseball team. It had a concert band. Um, they had competitions in town frequently. Among the more popular things was horseshoe pitching, occasionally wrestling, and of course going to the ball games, which were traditionally not played on Sunday because you had to go to one of those eight churches on Sunday. They do claim to have a city park, if you can call it that today. It is a nice little oasis on the side of the road. There's not much to write home about. The pump does not work. I tried it just to see. Down the road, Highway 5, you've got the town of Hawking, or at least you have what used to be Hawking, or a hump that used to be the Hawking Mine. Um, not much left to write home about of Hawking either, but it was platted in 1899, and it was first known as Coal Creek. Why? Because, well, it was located on Coal Creek. And so uh, Hawking was flooded out by Coal Creek in 1903, barely got off the ground before it flooded out. And uh, unlike, oh, there we go, hang on. Ooh, upset it, touchy. Um, unlike uh, Heitman, there seems to be a lot more of activity going on at Hawking in terms of unrest. There's more fights there, there's the occasional murder there. But one of the more interesting things that I found there was that they claimed that they nicknamed the place Rattlesnake Gulch. Because apparently when they got down digging into the mines, they discovered lots and lots of rattlesnakes. And I thought, nah, that sounds a little bit suspicious because I just don't buy into that. So I called a friend of mine, I legitimately did this, got a friend of mine that works for the DNR up at uh, the Tama Settlement, at the Meskwaki Settlement. He's from, from that area. And I asked him what he knew about rattlesnakes in Iowa. And he goes, oh yes, they were native to Iowa in the 1870s. Who knew? Um, apparently timber rattlers were very common in southern Iowa and in eastern Iowa, and they liked wooded places with low depressions that people did not disturb them, which, yep, that pretty much describes the area of Hawking. So I wouldn't be surprised if there were rattlesnakes there. Um, there also were a number of incidents that happened at Hawking that resulted in disasters. There were at least two slate falls. There were a number of people that were killed in the mines. I'm not particularly superstitious, but if you dig in deep enough, there's some good folklore when it comes to miners that were trapped in the mines and whether or not they still can be heard in that area. I'm skeptical of that. People always ask me if I go out and ghost hunt on these things. I say I don't ghost hunt because it doesn't taste good with barbecue sauce. <laughs> Ghosts are too gamey. Another place where you occasionally saw a mining disaster was PK. Um, Post Office 1892-1908, that's up in Mahaska County. Anybody know anything about PK? Yeah, you wrote, you wrote the book on PK. Uh, well, I, I don't know, for some reason I just get a kick out of the name of it there. The owners of the mines, their last names began with letters P and K, so they combined them together and got PK out of it. Um, the P stood for Phillips. Phillips was a mining director in southern Iowa. He was very well known. He was most notably known for the White Breast Coal Company. If you go over to Lucas County, White Breast is all over the place over there. Um, Phillips was a mining town just outside of Lucas. Cleveland was another mining town just outside of Lucas. Mr. Phillips, who was involved in PK, was involved with both of those. The town of Cleveland over by Lucas is where you get John L. Lewis, who was probably one of the most colorful people to come out of the mining industry and one of the few people that I know of that successfully yelled at FDR. Here in Mahaska County, though, Phillips was busy with this, his own mine in Harrison Township, and it had a shaft of 80 feet in Harrison Township. So 80 foot shaft on there, the mine went underground and went to a depth um, of 500 acres, or excuse me, went a length of 500 acres. So it was a very, very large mine in the area. Coal vein was six to eight feet deep, and so there was a lot of good coal to be worked down there. Um, that also meant some trouble. On November 8th, 1892, there was an incident at the mines because they went down there and there was a powder ignition and ended up causing an explosion down there. A couple of people got killed. It was bad news, of course, but it could have been a whole lot worse because the explosion happened on election day that year and everybody was up at Mechikinik casting their votes. And so that one wasn't as bad as it could have been. Um, what's an interesting fact about PK is my great-great-great-grandfather mined there for a while before he moved to um, Cooperstown just outside of Buxton, which I don't want to know what he did there, but anyway. Um, so again, PK, it, it was a mining camp. It wasn't a, a, so much a formally established community. Um, 
But you can see here that when the mine blew up, it certainly made the rounds in the news. So we've got the Sioux City Journal up there. A terrible explosion occurred in the new coal mines at PK last evening. It was what's known as the mining circles as a dust explosion. The shock was felt for miles around. The air shaft in the interior was completely wrecked. Luckily, the mines had closed early as the mine men might vote. So only seven are known to have been caught. Well, yeah, seven's still a high number in my opinion, but they didn't have OSHA back then, so I suppose that was all right. Four of those have thus gotten out, and three of them were dead. You can see there's similar news from Esterville, from Cedar Rapids, Muscatine, all over the state. They picked up the story here and ran it. Obviously, it caught a few eyes up there. But it didn't compare to what happened a few years later in Lost Creek, when they had another much larger and much more severe explosion. Lost Creek was an established community. It was founded as part of the Lost Creek Coal Company. It wasn't too far from PK. Um, it almost didn't happen. The mine went bankrupt a short period of time after it opened and it was sold at sheriff's auction. So there was almost not a mine there at all, but the land proved to be too worthwhile for the investors. They came in there and they were able to buy it for a reasonable price and turn it over and make a pretty good profit. Nice thing about Lost Creek is that we know more about it from its descriptors. There's some letters that concern it. We know that the houses were built all uniform there. They were 24 by 24 feet and had four rooms in there. So if you think about a typical mining family, that's what they would have lived in. You have to remember a lot of these immigrant families though were large families. Sometimes they would have five, six, seven, eight children. So a four room house got pretty crowded after a short period of time. 24 by 24 is not very big. Again, typical of mining communities. Biggest incident though happened in 1902 what was called a windy shot. Windy shot was what happened when they went down there to blast more of the wall away so that they could expose the coal. They would put the charges in, charges would blow out the wall and they'd move further down in there. They would do this while the miners were down there. Today this don't, doesn't sound like a very good idea. In 1902 this was seen as a, march, uh, as a mark of efficiency because you can do the blast while the miners are down there, you don't have to waste time bringing them back up, they can just stay down there, clear the area, all is well. Well, the problem is, is that when you put the charge in at a right angle, it doesn't blow this way, it blows this way. And that's exactly what happened at Lost Creek. And the result was not good. Um, just for illustration here, I've included a portion of the Atomo Courier's fourth page article that ran a few days later. This one killed 21 down there. That got a lot more attention and that definitely prompted some change and they actually outlawed doing windy shot in the mines after that point in time. It's one of the earliest examples of a workman's compensation law in Iowa. It came out of this disaster there. And so you can see there, if, if you re to read through this, this is again not even the, the full article because it's, I mean, papers like this and this occupies a, it's a pretty large section of it. Um, you can see not only was it the initial blast that killed people, but there was issue with them being able to get out. There was the gas from the explosion, there was the smoke from the explosion, and then being able to get out of there with the falling coal also proved to be a problem. And so Lost Creek was kind of a non-issue for a long time, and then all of a sudden we have this explosion here and it becomes top of everybody's mind. And so it definitely got the attention of the, the legislature up in Des Moines, and that's where, if, again, you saw that first, um, the, that early law passed for workmen's safety. A number of other laws passed afterwards also ensured workmen's safety because the railroads themselves were particularly dangerous. Now I gotta watch my time here because I don't want to get too far in the weeds here, but you know, we talk about ghost towns and I make a joke about ghosts. I gotta at least include a ghost story in here because why not? We're here, right? So these were given to me. This is from a railroad spur called the Crooked Creek Railroad. It's up in Webster County. Webster County, obviously not anywhere near Monroe County. Why am I talking about Webster County? Hang with me for a second. Little town outside of Fort Dodge called Terra. Terra was a railroad community. It was a hot town. There was a saloon there and a hotel, and boy, did they do good business. When they were building the railroad through Terra, however, though, they had an incident on the railroad where a pile driver, which was a great big piece of equipment, came down and killed a man. The man was from Eddyville. They buried him up there. They eventually brought him back down here. But what's interesting in the ghost story that comes out of it is supposedly he would wander that track outside of Terra and people report seeing him and his lantern out there at night. Now the station agent in 1903, 1903, Fort Dodge, decided he was sick of this. He was tired of hearing these ghost stories, and so he decided to go out there in the middle of the night with some of his friends, who were all prominent people in, in Fort Dodge, and prove that this didn't happen. So they go out there onto the, the railroad tracks with one of those old-fashioned hand carts, you see in the movies. They carted themselves out there, 
middle of nowhere between Fort Dodge and Terra, and all of a sudden they see this light coming down the track. They're trying to figure out, is this a ghost or is this a train or what's going on? They book that cart back to the Fort Dodge as fast as they could. They radio down the track. The track manager says, there's no train on the track tonight. Well, Tilgren, the station agent up at Fort Dodge, uh, he never bothered to comment on it again. But when people brought up the story, it said that he turned a sheet of white himself. <laughs> so there may be a gentleman from Eddyville that's still up there in Webster County. We don't know. But the railroads, just like the coal mines, were very, very dangerous. They, again, did not have any OSHA at that time. And it showed. Uh, you know what? I should know it, but I don't. I can look it up for you here in a little while. I've got my notes on Terra somewhere here, so yeah, I can find that out for you. All right. Well, that's a little bit of a diversion, but it's a fun one here. So we'll get back down here. We'll get close to wrapping things up. A couple more towns to show you. Of course, Tioga, 1886 to 1970. By 1970, there wasn't a whole lot left of the town. There was still the church that was there, and that was really the main landmark. Unfortunately, the church was heavily vandalized, so what they did was they took it down. They preserved the bell in the cemetery. I'll show you that here in a second. Now, Tioga is actually more important than it looks like on the surface, not necessarily because of the town itself, but because of who the town was involved with. And again, I bring up the Webster, Webster County because the, Northwest, the Chicago Northwestern Railroad, which is what platted Tioga, had a company called the Western Town Lot Company. And if you know anything about Northern or anything about Central Iowa, the Western Town Lot Company is probably the most important and most famous company in Iowa history that you've never heard of. And you've probably never heard of them. That's okay. Again, they platted the town of Tioga. They founded it. They also founded a number of other communities. So if you think about founders and founders of communities being uh, siblings to each other, Tioga has some pretty good company in terms of its siblings, including Stratford, Stanhope, Jewell, Radcliffe, Coon Rapids, Woolstock, Irwin, Bradgate, Arthur. I didn't have room for Haywarden, Sioux City, Spencer, all platted by the same deep river all platted by the same town as what platted Tioga. You can see here it was never a huge town to begin with. Um, the uh, big draw of the community was its baseball team. They had a baseball team there. They had a general store that they couldn't keep in business. They also had a barber shop they couldn't ha keep in business. Thanks for coming. Um, you know it's bad when the general store and the barber shop can't stay in business, right? <laughs> Problem with Tioga is that it was what we would consider a bedroom community today. So people came out there to live. They lived out there because it was cheap. They would take the railroad, they would take the railroad into Oskaloosa and do their business there. So Tioga just did not do very good business. The other issue that they had is by the time Tioga was planted, the need for general store had d diminished because we had this little gem that came out. <laughs> Anybody remember these? This is Sears catalog here, that's the 1897 one, so it's about the same time Tioga showed up on the map. These were the Amazon of the day, and the general stores did not like these. But you know who did like the Sears catalog? Postal Service, because they made a fortune off of it. Well, Tioga had a bit of a problem with the Postal Service because all of a sudden it came out that nobody wanted to be postmaster, so they shut the post office down. The United States Postal Service looked at the map and they said, eh, Atwood, Atwood in Keokuk County is just up the road from, from Tioga. They can go up there and get their mail. What the Postal Service didn't realize was that they had to cross the water. They had to cross Skunk River to get over to get over to um, Atwood. And that was a problem because there was no way to get across it unless you walked on the railroad trestle, which is not a very safe thing to do. So after a short period of time of people either having to hike up to um, Rose Hill and get on the train and ride over to Atwood or hike across the trestle, uh, they were able to get their post office reinstated. And that was, of course, a significant benefit to the people who lived there. Um, Atwood is interesting because for a long time there were actually no real roads that led into the town. You could only get there by railroad. There's a remnant of it. That's all that's left of the church. They got the bell mounted out there. It's a nice little monument. All right, pick up the pace here. Lockman. Lockman was established around 1909, lasted until about 1940. It was one of the last big mining communities in this area. Um, there were, of course, other ones that, that stayed around, but they actually had the mines there operating until 1940. So they still had a mining, an active mining community and acting, active mines until 1940 at Lockman. And part of the reason for that was they were innovative there. They were able to bring in new strategies, and they were able to bring in um, new technology. A lot of the mines shut down during World War I, even more of the mines shut down during World War II. But Lockman managed to at least make it until the World War II era. And so there was an article that was ran in the Ottumwa newspaper that says, Coal, this is from 1920. 
Coal is still plentiful. Lockman Mine changes hands. New owners to develop and operate new shaft, new technology, increased tonnage. The Central Coal Company of Oskaloosa is to become the new owner April 1st, 1920. It's run by Thomas Evans, who has more than a quarter century in mining and speculation. The new miners will begin at once to develop and operate new shafts and increase the tonnage of the plants. The men who are interested are experienced and recognized as operators, and indications are that Luckman will be one of the largest mining camps in this section. And it worked for them. And it worked for the community, at least for a while. Miller Creek Com Coal Company ended up buying it out. Um, and again, by, 19, by 1940, most of the mining towns were beginning to shut down. Lockman disappeared uh, in the 1950s. Little remains of it today. Now, we've looked at a lot of communities tonight. We've talked about a lot of communities that met with a lot of different fates. We've looked at economic impacts. We've looked at um, cultural impacts. We've looked at socioeconomic impacts. But going back to the river town, even more than floodwaters, sometimes it's just a really chance fate that takes out a community. And Wright's a good example of that, because although 1883 to the present, Wright doesn't have a whole lot of presence left today. And that's unfortunate, because it was doing pretty well up until 1984. And does anybody know what happened in 1984? Yeah. I figured a few people remember that. That's probably a little bit close comfort. Um, June 1984, Wright was destroyed by a tornado, or at least most of Wright was destroyed by a tornado. It took out the church, took out the school, took out the community center, took out a number of the houses that were there. Um, Wright was not the only town that was hit that night. That was one of the worst tornado outbreaks in Iowa history. There were dozens of towns hit, including my hometown of Ankeny. But Wright was one of the only ones that was nearly completely wiped off the map. And that natural disaster took most of the town with it. And that's unfortunate because Wright had a very interesting history. They had people that, that had their businesses there. They had their own baseball team, too. Uh, Ginger, uh, does the name John Alsip ring a bell to you? Because he, he was the baseball manager there at Wright. Yeah. Did you really? That I did not know. Oh, wow. Okay, sorry about that. Um, yeah, so you know what? It really is a matter of fate sometimes. And we can predict what towns might work out better than others. We can, we can predict what towns are going to survive and are going to thrive. But really, it all comes down to luck. And perhaps that's it from the air. Um, one of the ones that's met with some of the most misfortune, actually, is the small town of Keb, which was a mining town in Wapolo County, um, which is mostly, as I understand now, a dump site. Um, Keb saw the writing on the wall. And I don't have time to go through this whole thing here, but if you can see this newspaper article that I found from the Atoma Courier, it proclaims in very large headline letters, Keb is doomed. <laughs> if that's not the writing on the wall, I don't know what is. Okay, so let's wrap this up here. Why is this important? Why do we care about ghost towns? Who gives a darn about this? Why do we even bother talking about them? They're dead, they're gone, they're no longer part of, part of our, our universe. Well, at some level, I think we are all fascinated by what was once there. I mean, obviously, you're all here listening to me ramble about ghost towns tonight, so you've got some interest in the topic, I think. Most people do. My wife is a biologist by training. She's not particularly interested in history. A lot of times she rolls her eyes at this stuff. But every now and then I show her a picture of one of these buildings that's kind of falling apart, and I get this little bit of a side eye out of it, and I know I'm onto something there. Because at, at a basic level, there's something about our instinct that just wonders about these places. Why were they there, and why are they gone? And is that going to happen to us? Maybe it's a little bit of our own mortality. Of course, it's important for historical and genealogical research. Again, I said I'm a genealogist. I've, I've traced all four branches of my family back, um, three of them into the 1700s. Um, I can't say I've done it independently, I've had a lot of help with that, but that's part of genealogy is networking. And that's the thing with these towns too, is essentially at the basic level, they're networks, they're communities, they're places that people congregated. And so for the historical and genealogically minded of us, these places are important because they put the context of what the people lived in. They give us their worldview. We're able to understand their culture and how they lived and their, their, their prejudices and, and what made them excited because we can see what they did in these towns and how they came together as these communities. We can understand why some communities thrive and why some do not. There are a number of communities that, since I started this project in 2009, really have fallen into bad shape. But there's the flip side of that. There's a lot of communities that look a lot better than they did in 2009 when I started this. Atum has done a ton of work in their downtown area. 
Pella's done a lot of work in their downtown area. Sheraton, Oscar, I mean, it's just a lot of towns that have, have really invested in themselves. And especially since the pandemic, I think there's more of an interest in supporting local. Although I don't know what's going on in Oskaloosa with your Pizza Hut, but that's a whole other thing. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, Again, we want to prevent our own communities from meeting a similar fate. So if we understand what, what impact these towns and why they are no longer around, we can maybe avoid some of that in our current world. As we see places like Amazon become more and more commonplace, you know, we realize that we could lose those businesses. Amazon's great for some things. The convenience, of course, is really handy. But there's also something to be said to going down to a corner mom and pop shop and picking up what you need. You might pay a little bit more, but you're going to have a chance to visit with somebody. You're going to have a chance to interact with, with the community. Dang, that thing is touchy. All right, well, that's good. I don't have any pictures to show at this point here, so um, we'll just move on. The other big thing is that it shows us that communities, both ex existing and no longer existing, bring us together. When you talk about these ghost towns, when you talk about the communities that people lived in, we connect with each other. Our ancestors probably lived in some of the same communities. My family lived in Mahaska County, they lived in Wapalo County. I bet if we went back four or five generations, there are some of us that have some connections. And that's really fascinating because we can use those to bridge our differences, and we can use those to bridge worldviews. You know, somebody might be a Democrat, somebody might be a Republican, or a Protestant and a Catholic, and you find out you've got this common ancestry, now you've got something to talk about besides current events or things that are divisive. It brings people together. And so understanding your heritage in these places that people lived in helps you to connect with others. One of the things I want to share real quick before I leave here, and this is really kind of why I do this, um, is a quote that I came across from an author named Harry Skirdla. Harry Skirdla is not a very well-known name, and that's okay, um, but he's an interesting person because he is an architect and an essayist. <laughs> you don't find a lot of architects who are essayists. And he wrote a book in 2002 called Ghostly Ruins. It's a beautiful little coffee table book. And he writes in there, an abandoned building, he's talking about abandoned buildings, but we can extrapolate this to towns. An abandoned building is dead. It's as dead as any corpse laying in a field. But it too once lived, was animate, and in a sense, it had a soul. Except the soul was us. We gave it the life and the meaning, the motion and the warmth. We put the spark of light behind the shade lit windows and the circulation in its corridors. It consumed supplies and produced waste. The thing was alive and the life force was us. Because that's the common denominator with all these places existing and non-existing if you take out the people and the personalities, they don't have any meaning anymore. And so that's why I do this. I want to give these places meaning. I want to get people excited about them. And so I do. I post every few days on that Facebook site, getting people excited about communities that exist and communities that don't exist. And it's so much fun to read people's reactions. And it's fun to watch them share their memories because I have people that remember living in some of these towns or living nearby them and they can remember finding pieces of them or finding remnants, or a foundation, or maybe attending a church that's now gone. And it's so fun to see people connecting. And so that's what I'd like to leave you with tonight. This is all about connections. So getting out and getting to know one another, supporting history, and enjoying your community. And I would just invite everybody to make sure that they're doing that, and get out and have a good time with people that are around you. So I appreciate you having me tonight. This was a lot of fun. This was a great program to put together. I said uh, normally I focus on one county at a time, so this was kind of exciting doing three at once. Um, but I sure learned a few things and, and had a good time too. So thank you for inviting me down here and thank you for the opportunity to speak this evening. I only went over by 10 minutes. That's not too bad for me.